All right, hello and welcome to another Expert Inside interview. My name is John Golden from Sales Pop, online sales magazine and Pipeliner CRM, joining you as usual from San Diego. And today I am delighted to be joined from Colorado by Summer Davies. How are you doing, Summer? I am so well, John. Thank you so much for having me here. Yeah, yeah, of course. And Summer is an award-winning leadership development expert with over 15 years of experience. She helps burgeoning leaders develop the mindset and tactical skills to lead with impact, confidence, empowerment, and a genuine love for what they do. Uh, as a lifelong equestrian, <laughs> beekeeper, and, well, subpar snowboarder, so <laughs> Summer brings a unique perspective and sense of urgency to leadership development conversations. And what we're going to talk about today is not your snowboarding, um, but uh, we're going to talk about reviving the pulse, the urgent call for skilled first-time and frontline managers in small to medium businesses. So um, let's, let's get straight into it somewhere. There is a, I think this has always been the case, right? There is a dearth of good management because people are never really prepared for what management means. You know, John, you're absolutely right. It's um, such a common experience, especially in small and mid-sized organizations that we have folks who are really strong technical contributors. So they're the best at whatever uh, their organization does. And so they get promoted to be a manager and then they've got to lead people. Mm -hmm. And that skill set's just totally different. And for all sorts of really valid reasons, then these people get sucked in and time goes by and they don't have the opportunity to develop those really foundational skills that are essential. And it starts creating a snowball of unintended outcomes for these organizations. And it's it's a significant problem. Interestingly, I've been in this line of work for a long time and I've never once talked to somebody who said, oh, no, we don't experience that. That's not a problem for us. We, we you know. I don't, I don't see a need for that. Everyone I talk to sees that this is a problem and so many organizations just don't know how to fix it. Yeah, because I always think it's interesting because when people used to come to me when I, uh, when I run organizations and you talk about what do you want to do, you know, people who are doing well in their jobs, you know, everybody's always like the next, the next level is I would like to move up and maybe be a team leader or a manager and manage people. To me, that that's the only... Uh, the only progression we offer people, and yet not everybody's suited to it, but that seems to be, we've established that as that's how you measure progress in a lot of jobs is whether you get to move up and manage people. Is absolutely right. Very few organizations have thought through that talent pipeline enough to say we need to have technical leadership in addition to people leadership so that individuals mm -hmm. can say, I really want to sink deep into my profession. I want to be a technical leader, a thought leader, an innovator, but I don't want to lead people. That's not my bag. And then some people who say, you know, I, I like this line of work and I'd really love to help others get great at being able to do this too. And I want to have my profession be leading others. And they really are two different things. Mm -hmm. And some organizations just don't have the scale. They're small. And so that's not possible for them. Or they try to do that, but they don't make it simple for folks to be able to get into people leadership, try it out, and then without losing face, without feeling like, oh, maybe I've I've failed here, say, not for me. That is always looked at as, um, as a stumbling point if people say... I, I gave this a go and it's not my it's not my jam. And and that's dangerous for organizations because mm -hmm. then you trap people and you start promoting them to their level of incompetence. And then you end up with folks in, in kind of that middle slice of leadership or, or just below the C-suite who are who don't love leading people. And so they're kind mm -hmm. of struggling through it. They're not getting great energy from it. And because they're not really getting great energy, they're not giving your organization great energy, innovation, creativity. Uh, longevity. Uh, so it becomes this kind of vicious cycle that, uh, yeah. that we can fix, but it takes just some self, self-awareness self for organizations maybe to say, hey, this is reality of where we are. Yeah, no, absolutely. And that's why I always uh, always think that it's it's important to, for people to understand the reality. Because I used to say to people like, why, why do you want to manage people? And, you know, they give the thing. And I said, can I can I just give you an idea of what managing people is like? I said, number one is you're part psychologist, you're part um, parent sometimes, you're a punch bag sometimes. You're a lot of different things, and you have to be prepared for that. And the dynamic is going to change with those around you. That's the other part of it, the, the people you – and you may say, oh, well, I get on great with them, and they really respect me and all that. And it doesn't matter. The dynamic is still going to change, and you need to be prepared for this. 
It's, it's so right. And I think that question that you're saying there about why do you want to lead people? So many folks get a slick answer for that. They've mm -hmm. got something great in the interview and it doesn't necessarily connect to this is what I want to do mm -hmm. with my career. I want yep. to help bring out the best in others. I want to develop others. And I know much like you said, they're parenting. It can be so much fun. I've got little girls myself, so I know it can be so much fun and it can be the hardest job mm -hmm. on the planet. Leading people is quite the same. Although you're working with adults, it can be so much harder than people appreciate. And mm -hmm. it can be so much fun if you're yeah. skilled at it. And when you have managers that are having fun with it and are skilled at it, then you've got folks who are having fun working at your organization. And then you get all those great benefits that every organization is chasing um, and finding hard to, to achieve, especially now. And, and one of the other things, Summer, is like people will you know put you into a management position and then say, "Great, now go go coach those people and get them better." But they don't teach them how to coach. And coaching or coaching is a skill in itself. And most people don't understand it. Most people's idea of coaching is their is their high school coach screaming at them from the, the sideline, telling them what to do. And that's what they tend to bring into it. Then they go, well, if I tell somebody exactly what to do and they do it, then that's progress. Instead of saying, no, how can I help that person develop? And maybe they'll end up doing it slightly differently for me, maybe even better. Absolutely. Coaching is a skill. And knowing the difference between when to coach, when to give direction, when to mentor, what those things are, why are they different? How do you flex your style? That's that's a challenge. Oh I know God. very few people, if anyone, who just know that inherently. Either they've seen it, if they're good at it, maybe they saw it. But I have an actually funny story about this. I, I mentioned in my bio, I'm a subpar snowboarder. Mm -hmm. I learned to snowboard as an adult, which I grew up on skis. I knew how to ski. But as an adult in my 30s, I decided to learn to snowboard. And I've never seen a more beautiful example of somebody who had the ability to mm -hmm. take someone and move through those different styles of leadership than my snowboarding teacher. Wow. It was a small mountain. He was a teenager. So I looked at this guy and thought, oh, here we go. This teenager is going to teach this 30-year-old lady how to snowboard down the mountain. And instead, he had such a beautiful way of seeing, okay, in this first moment, she's got no clue what she's doing. I need to step by step. Mm -hmm. Be very directive, right? And then as she starts getting better, bring the direction back a little bit bring the motivation and the coaching up as they're having the moments where it's really hard. And then she starts to get it, start really acting more as a coach, bringing out what she already knows and encouraging her to continue to get better. That beautiful application of skill may be one of the only natural people I've seen be able to mm -hmm. do it. And we see leaders get stuck where they say, well, I'm really great at telling somebody how to do something. So I get stuck there and then they end up being a micromanager. Or I'm mm -hmm. really great at being a coach, which sometimes is great. And sometimes if you have somebody who has no idea what they're doing, make someone feel like they're lost. Yeah. And so knowing how to flex that style shows up beautifully in a progression when somebody's learning something new, like my snowboarding experience, but it also shows up beautifully in leadership when somebody can flex those styles and give their people what they need in that moment. And that's not a skill most people know, but it's absolutely learnable, especially when they're new in, in leadership. Yeah, and that's a, and that's a great point that you made there because we because sometimes people tend to adopt a one size fits all. But let's face it, we're all individuals, we're all different. Uh, and to be a really good manager or leader is you know you have to know how to communicate with the different individuals, right? I mean, there's obviously general communication, but the nuanced communication. Like you may receive something in a different way than somebody else does, so I may have to give, deliver a message differently to you than I would to a colleague. Absolutely. And so having that emotional intelligence, that self-awareness, maybe a little bit of empathy, it's a magic soup that comes together. And over time, leaders are able to flex that and change it depending on who they're working with. And even within that individual, what the task is. So classic situational leadership stuff, right? Mm -hmm. Being able to say, yeah, this is my superstar, but maybe something's new. Maybe something's changed and, and they might need something different from me than what I generally give. And... Uh, and that's, again, that's something that leaders tend to overlook the importance of. Um, and often organizations assume leaders just know how to do that when mm -hmm. that's not really a very fair assumption. And I think the other trap people fall into, uh, Summer, you probably come across this, is that we naturally, for some reason, humans like is we go to where we see all the problems, right? So we go, oh, look, this person over here isn't doing that well. I'm going to focus all my energy on them. 
And you know, you maybe you get a 5% improvement on them. It makes kind of very little difference overall. However, you've got these top performers or people who are doing well over there. Now, if you can help them increase 5% or whatever, now you've got something significant. But but a lot of times we always default over here to just looking at and focusing on the problem areas. And we don't do enough to, we don't focus enough on helping people be successful. <laughs> it's absolutely true. We're great at putting out fires because we can see them, right? Uh-huh. And most organizations don't need a manager to be a firefighter, although they might think they do. In fact, mm. they need a manager to be a great developer of people. And that's a different skill than putting out a fire. And sometimes it can be easy to say, oh, this person has this burning problem that's causing all these waves in the organization. Maybe we do need to address that. Mm -hmm. But if you put that same energy into developing the person who's just a touch away from greatness, there's where those brilliant ideas that are just hiding inside the brain of that person can start exploding out and make the difference in your organization. Um, Opening that door for those folks and, and putting that same energy into development versus firefighting again of course you've got to address the issues if they are serious but putting the energy into the development can prevent those issues from being just an ongoing firefight and that's where managers get exhausted because they're trying to fight fires and they don't know how to keep them from starting because they're just starting too late they're not starting with the development yeah and that can be and that can come right from the top i worked for an organization one time that was oh probably the best crisis firefighting i've ever seen by the executive team like they if there was a problem with a a, a a big customer blew up they'd fly us all in we'd all get together there'd be you know eight of us you know senior executives old people from all over we all put out, put out the fire everything's great and then we go back to normal uh, because they yeah. had no interest in fixing any of the things they loved. The, they're almost like addicted to the crisis management, I think. There's some interesting research right now about how addicted our brains become to crisis and to stress. Mm-hmm. Uh, we're really good at becoming addicted to that. And the story, unfortunately, that I, I tell often when I'm working with organizations and leaders is about firefighting a little bit. Um, and it's the Challenger disaster, which was a which was a NASA Mm -hmm. launch that happened in the 80s. I was a kid then. So if people are a little bit younger than me, they may not remember this, but I do. I remember it really vividly, right? NASA launches this this really anticipated and exciting um, rocket and it's live televised. And just a few minutes after it goes into the air, whole thing explodes, Mm -hmm. kills everybody on board. It's a huge tragedy, Um, embarrassment for for NASA and, and heartbreaking for the families of the people who are on board. And even more devastating is that people who worked at NASA knew Mm. that that spaceship was going to explode. They knew weeks before, they knew months before, but because they'd been so focused on the emergencies, they hadn't built a mechanism for those people to be able to escalate those concerns and those managers to be able to get it to the people who could stop the launch. Mm. So those people knew it was going to happen and they had to watch it happen on TV because there was nothing they could do about it because their organization wasn't able to give them a voice. And that story is so powerful when we think about firefighting and the importance of development, because I I hesitate to say this because I don't want to scare people, but you probably have a challenger disaster hiding somewhere in the corners of your organization. Mm -hmm. And if you have managers who are focusing on developing, focusing on engaging their people, you can get that out of the corners and address it through development before it blows up on live TV, right? And that is a powerful way for folks to say, you know, it it happens in every organization. It happens because we're busy, because we are really good at addressing the fires, but you don't have to have them. You can yeah. focus on development beforehand and get them out of the corners, get them out of the heads of your people and address it now mm-hmm. so that you can avoid those types of catastrophes or even better, get those great innovative ideas out Um and get the the next great idea that's living in the head of your employees out to to bring your organization to the next level. Yeah, no, I, I no, I absolutely agree. And I think another thing that, uh, uh, as well as that, another thing that people can do, which we don't like, we're great at catching people doing things wrong, but catching people doing things right and actually acknowledging it. Um, mm. That's such a great skill for for leaders and managers, but it's a very overlooked one. It's a very easy one, but it's a very overlooked one because, again, you know, we're hardwired. We show, oh, issue, 
uh, hey, you need to fix that. But then I go, mm, that's fine. You're doing that. Instead of going, cool, you're doing the right thing. <laughs> it's true. And I think the other element of that is sometimes we confuse recognition with feedback. So right. when somebody's doing something right, we may say, hey, great job, you know, high five, whatever, give them a kudos or whatever. Some organizations have really cool ways of, of giving people a, a reward or something if they're doing something great. Please keep doing those things. Mm -hmm. And it is more helpful for those individuals to understand what were they doing right? What behavior mm -hmm. specifically should they replicate? What was the outcome that this created? Because sometimes, you know, let's say you've got a, a big, a big visit coming from corporate or something yeah. and they come in and they're like, Hey, you know, team, great job. And then they walk out. The team may be really feeling good about that, but do they know what was good? Do they yeah. know what hit the mark and what they should replicate for the next time? Or will they just say, okay, well, we cleaned really well. Maybe we repainted a few things and everybody had a big smile on their face. That's what it was. When in fact, the big corporate guy saw something different and that's what they meant by good job. Mm -hmm. That happens so often and the folks don't know what was it that was good. And this then drills down to manager behavior when they say, you know, high five, good job to this person. Specifically what? What outcome was great what behavior led to that outcome so that that person can replicate it and others can understand what the behavior was that's good um, and we can perpetuate that type of improvement. Yeah, and I think that's a really, really important point that you just made there because it's the idea of not just understanding what somebody did, but perhaps what they did is something that then can be adapted for the whole group and, and you get that con continuous improvement. And then people and then people obviously feel extremely validated, especially if something you were doing now becomes like a standard operating procedure in your department. I mean, that's that's very motivating. And it shows that it, and, and it shows the teamwork. Yeah. And it helps that individual connect mm -hmm. to the outcomes of the organization and feel like, gosh, the work I'm doing here matters. It's making a difference to what we're trying to do. I now feel like I'm emotionally connected to the organization. And for so many organizations, I was actually just talking to somebody yesterday who was saying, gosh, the, we're hoping the great resignation is done, but we still struggle with talent. We still tr struggle with turnover. Um, we really want to make sure we're keeping the right people, all those things. When we're thinking about intent to stay as a singular mm -hmm. HR metric, when somebody feels that emotional connection and can say, what I do here contributes to the organization in this way, and I'm excited about that, it's a huge way to turn up that intent to stay mm -hmm. versus other types of rewards. It helps that person really feel an emotional connection to the product, to the brand, to the organization. And it's just as simple as connecting their behaviors, their outcomes to the outcomes of the organization. And sometimes we just forget to help them see that because we think, oh, they inherently see that. Yeah. And they may not. Um, no. Because of where they are, because of the work they do, because of how busy they are, all those reasons. Mm -hmm. So that those types of things, just a simple shift in feedback, a simple behavior can make a massive difference. And some of those metrics folks are just constantly trying to improve. Yeah. And, and the last thing I would say, it's also helping people understand like where the organization's going. I did, I ran, there's a couple of organizations I ran and I ended up with this process where every year from the strategic planning, you produce a one pager. It said, you know, what the goals were for the year that, and, and what our overarching goal was and everything. And I got it laminated in everybody in the organization, regardless their intern remote. And I said, put that in your workspace, put that in your workspace. And then, and, Anytime you're doing something and you look at that and you can't connect that to what you're doing, call your manager <laughs> and say, why am I doing this? Because I said, this isn't a criticism, but I guarantee you, we're all doing things that we've probably been doing for years that actually we don't need to be doing anymore or we need to be doing differently. And if you look at actually how is it impacting our actually our strategy or whatever you're saying, well, I can't see that connection. I said, go to your manager. And if we can't find a connection, let's get rid of it. Absolutely. I cannot tell you how many times I've had exactly that conversation. I actually had one last week with a with an individual I'm coaching who said, we've just been purchased by a venture capitalist company. They've come in, changing everything. We know this story. Mm -hmm. And sure. now they're sure. having me run this report. It takes me about an hour to do. I send it out to a couple hundred people across the organization. I have no idea how many people read it. I have no idea why it matters or if 
<laughs> or if it even does matter, but I don't have anybody I can talk to about this. Uh, and so that I would say is probably true in more organizations than than we would like to admit is, is folks are doing work, but not necessarily understanding how it connects to the mission or the goals of the organization. And I would even say, I love the laminated, just simple, right? It doesn't have to be a fancy deck or any no. you know TikTok video or anything, but just something simple to remind people, this is, this is what we're trying to achieve as, as an overall. And one of the important studies that's coming out recently is, is the old adage used to be that people needed to hear something seven times right. to connect to it. Because of some of the moves in social media and, and that sort of thing, it's sounding more like that's 11. <laughs> um, and so remembering that's almost once a month that you yeah. may need to be reiterating that so people can grab the concept. Yeah, no, it, it 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 is fascinating, but I do think that's one of the low hanging fruit if you can do it for mm. any any manager or leader, or whatever it is is. And if you go to the head of the organization, if you have to, and sit down and say, "I I want to understand what we're trying to do because I want to make sure my department is fulfilling, you know, is contributing in the optimal fashion." And that's you're right. I mean, more of those conversations need to take place, and 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 there just needs to be a better feedback loop. I think. Absolutely. Just make it simple. Sometimes we over we over <laughs> these things and want to make it something that it doesn't need to be. Keep it simple. Keep it focused. Most people don't need bells and whistles. They just mm -hmm. need that connection. And if yeah. you can provide them that, you're so much further ahead. Yeah. And what we didn't get into, obviously, but we can talk about another day is is doing this virtually because then there's a whole, you know, but the managing hybrid organization, managing remote, managing all of that. There's 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 quite a lot of demands now, especially if you're going to keep people who are remote connected. There absolutely is. And, and I'm I love this topic. I'd love to get into it yeah. on another chat. What I would say is the fundamentals don't change. Yeah. Managers who connect and have those foundational skills start there. If you've nailed that, then we can get into the fancy stuff of how do you collaborate and use all the cool tech and everything, yeah. which do absolutely do those things. But start with making sure your managers can do the basic things, prioritize, delegate, give feedback, empathize. They can do those. It's a good place to start. Excellent. Fantastic place to finish. Listen, thank you again, Summer. Thank you for watching and listening. But before we go, Summer, please do tell people a little bit more about what you do. Absolutely. So you can probably tell from... What I've said so far, I work with especially new and frontline managers building foundational skill. And I, and I really try to focus on making that easy for small and middle-sized organizations who maybe don't have an L&D department or haven't yet thought about this and think, I really want to support this group of people. Not sure how to do it. I can help you figure out how to do it. So you can find me on LinkedIn. You can find my website. I'll make sure you guys have all the links for that. Fantastic. Yeah, all of Summer's information will be below this video. So I would encourage you to go check it out. Yeah, and if you're if you're considering a, a career in management or there's an opportunity coming up, you know, go check out Summer, check out the resources, and then ask yourself the honest question, why? Just ask yourself that question, why? Why do I want to be a manager? And if you can answer that, you'll probably be, answer that positively, it'll probably be a good one. That's absolutely right. <laughs> all right. Listen, thanks again, Summer. Thank you for watching and listening. And I will see you all again soon. Thank you.